So evolutionary biologists have recognized these patterns for a long time and have been quite comfortable in recognizing how a trait may change in function through time. And extending back then to Darwin has been the notion that, well, always a small change one generation to the next could eventually lead to macroevolution of these really large changes. Now, here's where we're going to have to stop in and say, well, okay, Darwin was great for his time. He had an enormous amount of insights. But we do know a lot more about inheritance and the evolutionary process today than in the past. Now, I want to take as an example of how changes may be a combination of small changes, but sometimes rather rapid change when we look at feathers. And let's look at an animal we've seen fossils of before, Archaeopteryx. It has feathers just like a modern bird. It still has teeth. It's from 150 million years ago. Already with the fully developed feathers. But here we're going from an ancestor with scales. That's nothing like the feathers of a bird. How do we get from scaly skins to these really incredible feathers? Now, if we look at the fossil record, we find that they didn't go directly from plain scales to elaborate feathers, but there were intermediate forms. Dinosaurs are now being found, particularly in China, with such beautiful detail that we see fossil feathers. And these little feathers covered the body, and these are not flying animals. They have a covering. Okay, here's some feathers, some of these early feathers trapped in amber, and you can see the details, beautiful uh, cross pieces on the shaft coming out from the body. So we have a lot of dinosaurs that turn out to have had a kind of feather, very short downy feathers, okay? And the first arms that became wings were not yet capable of flight, so it's kind of like with our gill flaps on the stone flies that some of these earliest bird type organisms may just have used these to assist their mobility while they're still touching the ground or in some cases maybe climbing trees. We give them just enough lift to make them able to run up a tree faster. So we do have intermediate forms both in the feathers and in the wings that would be the, the site where the big flight feathers would later be attached. Now these feathers, besides being very short, some of the first very long feathers are likely to have been very colorful. And so these feathers may have been serving other purposes besides flight. And so these are reconstructions. Uh, we know that from some of the recent fossils that some birds actually had pigments. These uh, earliest birds of all had very pigmented feathers, bright coloration found in this fossil. Uh, which still has fingers out there, and it still has some of these early pseudo uh, flight feathers on its hind legs. And so um, other coloration in the bird's feathers are found here, like in a starling where it's iridescent. You kind of look at it in a different angle in the light, and it's got a different sheen. So these features of modern bird feathers were already found in very early uh, fossils. And so these traits were not necessarily involved at all with flight, but perhaps signaling each other. When we get to sexual selection, uh, we'll see that bright coloration is very important for attracting a mate. So at the very beginning, the very first sign of growths out of the dinosaur's skin, they were spines. So here's a fossil from an unpronounceable dinosaur called Concavenator corcovatus, and this dates back to some long ago time on this fossil tree. Uh, and this is a lineage that is allied with the, what would eventually become the birds, but is not a direct precursor to the birds. But what we see from the fossil is that on its forearm there are these knobs. And these are, in modern birds, associated with quills. So where the flight feathers come out, the quills kind of pivot in some way against 
a mechanism on the bone. So these same things are present in these early dinosaurs. The spines themselves were nothing like modern feathers, of course, but it's the same location, and it's like the central shaft of a feather growing out from the arm. So the first modifications to a dinosaur scale likely involves some sort of spike or spine. And so these first feathers would have protruded out from the surface of the body. And these could then be altered by having them form multiple shafts coming out. And this is like a downy feather. And so a lot of these dinosaurs who had these kind of ancestral feathers growing out of their bodies, that would have been a source of warmth, just like a down coat is warm for us. Then going from this rather stiff spine to get to then these cross pieces, which then have further cross pieces that perform a very special function in being very lightweight and very rigid, being able to hold the wind as they push down. This, it turns out, may not have involved that many genetic changes. So unlike the eye, which we think may have involved hundreds or thousands of small genetic changes, at least as for our discussions today, what's really striking about the evolution of the feather is that we know from modern genetics that a relatively small number of genetic changes are required to develop a complex branching pattern, only a few. Darwin's views were that evolution changed very gradually. Slow, continuous, microevolution would lead to macroevolutionary change. Now, we do want to modify Darwin's original viewpoint because now we have a lot of new information on the basis of genetics. Darwin's traits that we would still consider to be classically Darwinian are multilocus traits. And we've seen examples like height and skin color where multiple different loci all influence the same phenotypic trait. You get that bell-shaped curve, and if there's directional selection, you get more and more of the alleles that all those different loci moving towards this new optimum. So we get that slow, gradual change. But we now know that some genes have a much greater impact than others. And the genes that influence early physical development will have the largest impact. Let's look at bird feathers as a good way to introduce ourselves to some of these developmental genes. It turns out that the complex structure of a feather, so you have that central shaft, you have these side branches, and then the little hooks that hold everything together, there's three different loci that severely disrupt the normal development of the feather. One of these is called noggin, and you don't need to remember these precise names. What I want you to get is that a mutation on this particular locus called noggin causes these nice branching hierarchy to break down, okay? So instead of there being a central shaft here with the side pieces and the hooks, we may have multiple spines coming out, and there may be multiple side branches, so everything may go myriad shapes. And then these two bump four and bump two, they also have an influence on the overall architecture of the shape of the feather, causing grotesque changes from what a normal feather would look like into something that's really, really quite awkward and really quite random almost, okay? Now the point of these is that just having these three mutations, they're gonna influence how a physical structure grows out, like from a follicle, like we have hair growing from our follicles, so do feathers grow out from the equivalent of a follicle. And if the way that this is being formed in the follicle is altered, so that these different pieces are coming out in different ways, you get very, very different shapes. And in fact, in the normal development of bird feathers, those that now produce downy feathers in a modern bird are regulated by a certain number of genes that are active so that you do get that splitting, so you do get multiple spines coming out and you get a nice downy feather. Others that may be downy for a while and then they behave more like a flight feather and then these are the flight feather, very, very precise. Okay, These control just by a few developmental genes 
And we can see that that's controlled by those developmental genes through mutations that cause them to misbehave very radically. It turns out that a lot of different physical characteristics are influenced by these developmental genes. So what I want you to get so far is that genes that influence growth and development can have large impacts on phenotypes and they can produce large-scale change in just a few generations.